Lieutenant General Pyatt, you are now recognized for your testimony. Lieutenant General. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and distinguished members of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, good afternoon. My name is Walter Pyatt. I serve as the director of the Army staff. Thank you for the invitation to appear before this committee to speak to you about the Army's actions in support of the events that took place on January 6th in our nation's capital. Before I begin, I would like to extend my sincere and lasting gratitude to the brave men and women who heroically defended the Capitol on January 6th and without question saved many lives. I also wish to extend my deepest sympathy to the families who lost loved ones that day. On the days leading to 6 January, my role was to assist then Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, and to ensure that the Army staff provided the DC National Guard with the resources they required to accomplish their mission. The Army's role on 6 January began as unarmed support by the DC National Guard to the Metropolitan Police. By midday, the mission had changed drastically to respond to the attack on the Capitol. That change in mission was unforeseen, and we were not positioned to respond with immediate support. My involvement with our response to this emergency began shortly after entering the Secretary of the Army's office at 2.20 p.m. to provide a report of a suspicious package. While I was there, a panic call came in reporting several explosions in the city. To understand the situation and to identify what was needed from the Army, Secretary McCarthy convened a conference call. During this call, D.C. and Capitol authorities frantically requested urgent and immediate support to the Capitol. We all immediately understood the gravity of the situation. Secretary McCarthy ran down the hall to seek approval from the Acting Secretary of Defense. Before departing, he directed me to have the staff prepare a response. I communicated this on the conference call but those on the line were convinced that I was denying their request, which I did not have the authority to do. Despite clearly stating three times that we are not denying the request, we need to prepare a plan for when the Secretary of the Army gains approval. While I was still on the phone, then Lieutenant General Flynn rushed to establish a secure planning session with all the right staff personnel we were going to need to prepare for this new mission. Lieutenant General Flynn's immediate interpretation of the urgency of the situation allowed the Army staff to begin identifying the many critical actions and considerations we needed to address and address rapidly. We needed to redeploy the DC National Guard from 37 locations throughout the district, alert and recall soldiers from their civilian workplace, organize into unit configurations, equip the force, prepare an employment plan to include communications, specific routes, link-up locations, casualty evacuation, the rules for the use of force, determine if the DC Guard would be armed or not armed, with or without riot control gear, and how and where the DC National Guard would be deputized to support federal law enforcement. While we continued planning, the Secretary of the Army went into the district and met with Chief Conte and Mayor Bowser to coordinate for the commitment of the DC National Guard. The Secretary surveyed the Capitol to establish where the best link-up point would be. By 4.32, we had an approved plan. And at 4.35 p.m., the Secretary of the Army ordered the D.C. National Guard to move to the Capitol and begin establishing perimeter security. Once the D.C. National Guard was committed, the Army staff continued to prepare and conduct planning to receive additional forces, identify what barrier material would be needed, and where it could be found, how it would be contracted for, and employed and in place to enhance the protection of the Capitol. On January 6th, our Capitol was attacked, breached, and penetrated. Your lives, those of your staff, the U.S. Capitol Police, and many others were threatened by a dangerous mob. Our collective mission now is to learn from this event and ensure an event like this never happens again. I hope that my testimony today 
will prove useful to that end. Thank you. I am prepared to answer your questions. Thank you for your testimony. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah, you know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, the, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting America Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. 
And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.